y'all. We're here today with Dr. Will Tuttle, an incredible inspiration, real life hero on humor, healing humanities, humanitarian chronicles. Dr. Will Tuttle is a true humanitarian that I need to chronicle, and you'll see why. Um, he wrote the book, The World Peace Diet. It has been called the most important book of the 21st century, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, Dr. Tuttle is the embodiment of someone that's living the World Peace Diet. He has a PhD in education, intuition, and altruism. Good on UC Berkeley for having a PhD in all of that. He is a renowned, uh, world-renowned composer, musician, writer, peace, act peace activist. He's been a vegan for 30 years, joining the ranks of Leonardo da Vinci, Einstein, Emily Dickinson, Martin Luther King Jr., Pythagoras, George Bernard Shaw, Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, when they needed to be visionary, the list goes on. Uh, among brilliant other spirits, he is a Zen monk and Dharma master and the recipient of the Courage of Conscience Award. A huge inspiration to myself and others. Dr. Tuttle, thank you so much for being here today. Great. Thank you, Abby. Thank and thank you. you, everyone, for listening. Amen. Well, Watch I want to start out with a quote of yours and tell me if you recognize this one. No. As long as we remain at the core, a culture that sees animals merely as commodities and food, there is little hope for our survival. The systematic practice of ignoring, oppressing, and excluding that is fundamental to our daily meals disconnects us from our inner wisdom and from our sense of belonging to a benevolent and blessed universe. By actively ignoring the truth of our interconnectedness to all beings, we inescapably commit genocide, suicide, and forsake the innate compassion and intelligence that would guide us. So that's basically the crux of the World Peace Diet, one of the cruxes of the World Peace Diet. Um, but yeah, can you, how are you doing carrying this torch? How can you live in a world where the greater world is not understanding that? Thanks, Abby. You know, the, I think the most important thing to remember is that we're all born into this. You know, it, it's it's a, it's been happening. I talk about this in the World Peace Diet that it looks like around, as far as we can understand, about 10,000 years ago, we had this herding revolution where we started to own animals as property for food. And so since then, we've been born into a culture where from the time we're little infants, we're just forced and, you know, compelled to participate in mealtime rituals where it's not that we're, we get up in the morning and we think, gosh, you know, I just want a chicken to suffer. I'm going to go to Kentucky Fried Chicken and, and really cause a lot of suffering. We never think that way. We, we yeah. just, you know, we're late to work. We, run, we stop by, we grab something to eat because we've got to get, you know, we're doing good work. we got to get things done and we got to eat something. And so it's, uh, it's this invisible uh, system, really, in many ways, the food system, the, the uh, it's an industrialized, uh, massive system, actually. And uh, we're all participating in it. And we're all, if we're eating animal foods, we're actually propelling it along by our votes. You know, I think uh, I always say our wallet is the voting booth, uh, yep. where we take out our wallets. And when we vote, then we're causing this to happen. So yeah. For me, it's not, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's painful, like you say. It's very painful. It's uh, excruciatingly painful, to, really, in many ways, to be conscious and aware of the enormous suffering that animals are experiencing. Ecosystems are being devastated. Wildlife is being harmed. People are going hungry who could eat the food that we're feeding to animals, which is causing food shortages that are driving uh, war and conflict, terrorism and refugees, you know, this massive amount of suffering. People get sick. They have the, the diseases that come from eating these foods. And so it's a great question. You know, how do we, how do we um, carry how, on how do in the face of all it? that? You know? uh, yes. And, you know, I, I pray to God to find my village. I, I've been looking for my village pretty much my whole life. You know, it's, it's, it, you talk a lot about it, like the sense of interconnectedness interconnectedness belonging um and maybe it's because I started my life out eating meat that I was so confused obviously it is but you know I dream of surrounding myself with people who are on my same wavelength about not eating murder cruelty death torture suffering um aka being vegans though that's not the reality that's not the reality for me and my family and my friends from from birth that I love. So like, how do you go to a Thanksgiving dinner, for example, that you're invited to with a corpse on the table or a holiday dinner featuring, you know, a, a, and, and it's a stuffed 
apple stuffed animal. Do, do you <laughs> accept those invitations or do you not? I mean, how, where do you stand in the right. modern world? You know, I like you said, I've been vegan now for quite a few years. It's actually, it's about, I guess this is like 37th year. Oh my gosh, and see, that was an old bio I read. 37! Yeah. Wow. And so, but but really, quite honestly, it doesn't come up that often anymore that I find myself in those situations. But really, for the right. for the first probably 25 years, I did. <laughs> I spent quite a few years, you know. And uh, my family, you know, there would be Thanksgiving or, or there'd be chicken or whatever it happened to be. And and I would uh, you know, do my best to explain to everyone and let's watch a video after dinner, everybody. And, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And Want indigestion? <laughs> right, exactly. If that corpse so that you I, just ate is not going to give it to you, this video will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think... I think I always, I always felt that that I had an obligation to try to share these ideas with anyone who would listen. Yeah. And if people really wouldn't listen, then I, I, I didn't push too hard. But but I think, you know, people on some level, most people are somewhat willing to listen in the sense that we all know that animals do suffer. Most people do have a companion animal or some kind of connection with the animals. So we know that, gosh, we love animals. We don't want to hurt them. No one wants to hurt animals totally. because they're... They're so beautiful, and they're not trying to hurt us, you know. Definitely. So there's that's the thing is people have this um, deep wound. We all we're all wounded. Even as vegans, we're wounded by being raised in a society of violence. And so instead of getting angry, I, I did you know for a while. I remember I used to get angry and frustrated with people for not changing. Too many and, wrinkles. How can they do Too this? many wrinkles. You know? Don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> so. You know that that. But now I feel a little more compassion for them because I know that. People are blocked. They've been uh, forced into this behavior, and, and it's against our natural tendencies. So the idea is to is more and more for me anyway to be effective as an advocate. I think that's the most important thing. Yes, you know, yes. And, and so you are, you are. I mean, yes, what? you are effective as an activist. I mean, hey, your book completely inspired me, changed my life, and so many others' lives. I'm actually. I'd like to start, I would like to focus on, I want to call upon all the mothers I know and the women I know. I want to start speaking to my fellow woman out there because, especially the mothers in our world right now, because as the Dalai Lama said, the world will be saved by the Western woman. And I want to appeal to you mamas here with this conversation that Dr. Tuttle can definitely join me in. Women and mothers know that we need to protect, not exploit our children, the vulnerable, Okay, a mother will fight to the death to pr protect her child, will suffer horrifically when her child's suffering, never recovers when her child dies. Look what just happened. Carrie Fisher passed away. Debbie Reynolds, her mother, died one day later. Her mother died of a heartbreak. She couldn't live with her daughter's death. I know parents who've lost their children who are half alive. It, it, you know, it's been 25, 35 years. One of my aunts lost her daughter at age nine. She was my aunt, you know, for until she... For my till I was thirty, and still every single day talked about Ginny and and her daughter dying. I, I mean it. So, you know, like a mother cannot even stay fully alive once her child has died. How then can we eat food that supports the practice to, of uh, humans stealing babies away from their mothers, m murdering them and killing them in front of their eyes? How can we support that? Can you talk a little bit about that? What's going on for our mothers out right. there? You did a great job, uh, Abby, just now, I think, really uh, helping us to remember the, the sacredness and power of the mother-child bond, which is really not just for humans. It's across all mammals, for sure, and all birds. It seems to be all birds and oh, pretty yeah. much you know, all the animals that we're eating, basically. Uh, even fishes, actually, seem to have a, a powerful um, bond. But the thing to understand is... <clears throat> Uh, I think, uh, like you say, if we can uh, help people remember this, not in a way where we're shaming them or blaming them or criticizing them, don't you know, you know, as soon as we start pointing our finger at people, you know, but to really share, uh, gosh, you know, I'm so glad that I realized that all those years I was eating animal foods, I was only following orders that were given to me, forced upon me by well-meaning people. Airplane, uh, eh, eat your chicken, right, eat your right, chicken. Airplane. <laughs> I was one of those well-meaning people. I know. 
<laughs> so yeah, it's, oh, protein, I have a you younger know, brother. Like, yeah. Protein, you know. yeah. yeah. And she kept spitting it out and it kept putting it down her throat. You know, so um. there's these well-meaning people that are <clears throat> that want us. So just to just you know emphasize that I'm so glad that I understand now that these foods uh, are not necessary. Number one, they're absolutely not necessary. And number two, um, to to really um, convey not only how glad we're out that we're no longer participating in this behavior, but also the extent of the of the abuse that actually uh, these animals endure because. It really is uh, the most powerful psychological and physical stress and struggle and violence that we're inflicting on these animals by impregnating them against their will on what industry refers to as rape racks. And then after, for example, in the case of cows, they go a full nine months like we do. And the birth process for them, like for us, it's painful, it's difficult. And when they give birth to a baby, they're so, they just, now they, they want to love and nurse and protect and nurture that baby. And the baby wants nothing more than to be loved and nurtured and protected and to, and to, uh, to nurse. And yet on any dairy, organic or not, it, the baby is always immediately stolen and killed. And then the mother's impregnated again. And nine months later, the, the, that cycle repeats. And so this is what's happening and after about five times of doing this, then the mother uh, is sent off and she's killed. One of the babies will not be killed typically to be a slave on the dairy to follow her mother. But the, 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 the underlying foundation of animal agriculture really that we're supporting with our uh, dollars and that we're not only supporting, but then we eat it, right? We actually build this temple with the bricks of misery and violence and despair and disease and horror and feed it to our children. So we really are acting in a, in a somewhat hypnotic trance in the sense that we're engaging in behavior that we never chose ourselves. And the violence, though, in the dairy products really has these, in, in any animal foods, has these two components. One is it's killing. The other is it's the sexual abuse of impregnating and stealing and breaking the bond between mother and child, whether it's pigs or cows or chickens or, or turkeys or any of these animals. It's always this violent uh, thing and I think we all know as little kids there's nothing worse than if we're stolen from our parents and, and if we're just abused I mean this is how can we have healthy families when every day we're sitting around the table and eating foods that are based on destroying healthy families That's you the said thing. it you said it I'm no killjoy honey but I cannot I can't get over how many people mourn deaths of superstars. I mean, everyone on every page of Facebook is posting about Carrie Fisher, Prince, Mike, George Michael. I am too. Hey, I lit pink candles and purple candles on my Hanukkah menorah last night in honor of Prince and George Michael this year. I did. But why? There are 75 million animals being raped, exploited, tortured, skinned alive, killed. They're not killed they're not put out of their misery this jugular throat slashing it's not true they are alive when they are dismembered okay so these animals are being tortured and murdered 75 million a day is that right just 70? in the united states and that's i've I realized just in the I, united I gave states that, i gave that number for years and i realize now that it's very it's actually very conservative it's actually a lot more than that but but even 75 million is a number we can't even wrap our minds around every day. You know, every day, more than, I'd say, 100 million animals, uh, 75 million in America alone, but more, are being murdered, uh, raped, tortured, and murdered every day. And where are those rallies? Like, I hear the screams of football teams, you know, college football games. And, you know, my friends are like, oh, come with us to a football game. I'm like, you know what? I'll come with you when that many people gather to replant the rainforest or to, like, acknowledge the truth of what's on their dinner plate. What's under your fork? When there's a rally for that, let me know because I'll go. <laughs> so, you know what I'm saying? You know, when 75 million sentient beings are murdered daily and we snap selfies of ourselves devouring their corpses, you know, only tears that are shed when we're cutting onions for their stew are the ones that are shed. You know, I, I see that corpse on the table and I'm crying, not from onions, from knowing what went into that, you know, but yes. I, I listen, I, artists contribute greatly to our world. They do. So do animals, not for our plates, not for our taste buds and not for our health. And I'd love to talk about that because speaking of you know, babies being stolen from their mothers, screaming in agony when their babies are stolen, 
uh, fish, they do feel pain. They've been hooked up to sensors when their babies are taken out of their schools, do feel pain and do reflect that. Uh, oh my gosh, goats, pigs, uh, cattle, cows, all of them experience pain when their babies are stolen from them. So then these dairy cows that are forced to be pregnant their entire lives, they couldn't get pregnant in all that grief, by the way. No one in grief can get pregnant, really. I mean, your body has to be uh, you know, from being a health educator, your body has to be a living temple of life to breathe life. That's why so many people are not able to produce life these days. And they, they go to the doctor for IVF and hormones and stuff. It, they're either in grief or eating grief on a, on a plate because that we are what we eat. So when these animals yeah. are, are in grief from their babies being stolen and they're crying and mooing and screaming and then, you know, slapped back into the cage and put those clamps on their mams to produce more milk, uh, that milk is full of grief and pain and suffering and anger. And there have been scientific studies, if you need science, if, if your heart's not open enough, your heart chakra and your third eye and your consciousness isn't awake enough to just know that you shouldn't be eating murdered beings, eating the secretions of suffering, angry, grieving animals is, is de so detrimental to our health. And there have been studies in human mother's milk lots of them done. You can look them up. And I think Dr. Tuttle, you talk about this in your book, um, right. that y y please expound when, when babies eat the milk of angry mothers, it affects yeah, their it, health. Right. It's not good for their health. It's well understood. It's not good for their health. And the, and the mother, you know, is putting out hormones that will make her baby sick very often. And, uh, think about the dairy cows who are being horribly abused and are living in terror and despair and, uh, really, uh, with a tremendous uh, fear of the future in many ways, this foreboding feeling that they have that, you know, there's, this is going to happen again, it's going to happen again, and that does happen again. Uh, these animals are very intuitive. I've seen it. You know, I, I talk about it in the World Peace Diet, how um, when I was at that, that beautiful little cute little organic dairy farm in Vermont where nothing bad could ever happen, you know, they talk – we, we, uh, everyone has this romantic idea about a small dairy with only a few cows. Everything's good, but it, it's absolutely the same process. As soon as the, the you know the, the the mother cow who's given birth to maybe three or four calves and is being milked when she she's only five years old oh. uh, and she's still young essentially and she should be in the prime of her life. Uh, since they live to be 25 years old, at that point she's worn out, she's old, she's beaten down to the point where they have to just kill her. And we did that. I remember at this little dairy farm in Vermont, and we put a gun to this cow's head and just pulled the trigger. You know, it took three times. And I remember very clearly, you know, I was only 13 years old, 14 years old. We did. I was there for a few years, and every year we did that. Uh, we killed the cow together as part of the sort of learning how life actually operates. But wow. I'm, in a way, I'm glad I went through it because I could, I can see uh, how the human mind is capable of compartmentalizing. You know, we can say, "Oh, I love my dog, and I, I would not want anyone to do anything to my my dog or my cat." Right. But this cow, well, you know, we can't get milk money, so now we're going to get meat money. You know, and we just see her, see her as a thing. And uh, and I remember the second year. Uh, when we were going to, you know, kill her and and uh, not do it in the barn because it made such a huge mess, and we tried to pull her to this grassy knoll, you know, where the blood would soak into the ground, and she literally knew she knew something. She didn't want to be part of it, and she ended up actually breaking the chain that we were using with a pickup truck to pull her there. And I remember her looking at us with in silence, but I could hear very clearly what she was saying. It was obvious. She was saying, please don't kill me, you know, and, and what I would have said the same thing. It's, it's, um, oh. it's something I think the really, I think the thing that is really, um, uh, remarkable in a sense about this, that we as human beings, um, could have our hearts shut down so tightly that we're able to actually look at a, an animal and, and say that her, her worth is, based on how much she weighs, right? I mean, that's the only worth she has is by her weight or by how much milk she can produce. And how would we like it if a superior species 
much more uh, capable and power were to look at us that way that we you know we say but wait a minute you know i mean i, mean, I can um I, you know i can i can tell a good joke you know i can, I can play the piano i mean <laughs> you know I'm, I'm worth more than just you know uh, right, right. how much i weigh and it's like no no all we care about we're going to eat you that's all that's all that matters i mean how incredibly barbaric and primitive we actually are to reduce beings so grotesquely to that level of just by the pound, selling people, selling them by the pound, and uh, that we have to be asleep, you know, to Definitely. do that. We could never do that consciously. Definitely, and you touched on it. It's it, these these young, beautiful, vibrant animals that are killed. Um, you know, average age of a dairy cow is four. They die a lot younger. They just can't live with their babies being stolen constantly and being tortured and over milked and the mastitis and disease and antibiotics, hormones, pesticides, poison that goes into to raise keeping them alive when they're so sick and grieving. Um, you know, you touched on it, like these vibrant beings that are meant to frolic and scamper and live full lives as babies, babies having babies. Uh, you know, um, stillborn, stillbirths. Uh, I, can you please talk about how all everything that we are doing to animals with our supreme power it, is a reflected in our culture? And I love that you said, yeah, that sentient being is reduced to how much does it weigh? That's how much it's worth. They're doing the same thing. They're objectifying women. We are object, objectifying women in our culture by how little they weigh. In the Victorian days, it was how much do you weigh? How big are your bosoms? In these days, it's how little do you weigh? Hopefully, we're getting back to Victorian. Let's be normal women here, ladies. But, yeah, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, <clears throat> right. I have a, a sub-chapter in the World Peace Diet, and I still see this happening all the time, actually, uh, in society around us called As You Sow, So Shall You Reap. It's yeah. basically the boomerang effect. You know, whatever we put out there comes back. Whatever we sow, we reap. This is a, a universal, not only a spiritual teaching, but it's a universal logical teaching. We all know this in our bones that what we put out comes back eventually. And if we yes. want to have more love in our life, then we're not going to get it if we're always uh, spiteful and critical. About it, you know, it's as we're loving and kind and generous that we have a life of abundance and caring. And what we're doing to animals, uh, specifically, every every single thing that we do to animals. Uh, specifically, we will see reflected right back on us. And so I think when all of us, when we look at the news, basically, and we see what's happening to us, we see that the problems that we're having, we're inflicting on animals. The physical diseases we're having, for example, like this obesity epidemic with more and more people being overweight. You know, we have scientists, whole armies of scientists who have only one job, which is how to use lighting schedules and feed schedules and, um, and, uh, breeding and anything they can think of to maximize weight gain as quickly as possible, right? So we force obesity onto billions of animals and what do we have? We have this obesity epidemic. Yeah. And, and the same thing with most of the disease we're having, cancer is another one. We just, these animals really, we're feeding them such horrific food and they're so hyper confined and so, so totally stressed that they have very high rates of cancer. And we're eating, not only eating cancer, we're getting, we have this cancer epidemic, which of course is making billions of dollars for large chemical industries and large pharmaceutical industries. And same thing with osteoporosis, same thing with sort of the social problems that we're having, breaking down their families, we find that happening. And so the whole idea is yeah. that we can have, the beautiful thing to remember, I guess, really, the positive message in all this is that as we wake up and we move away from this and toward a more sane, compassionate, just way of living, we can stop sowing the seeds of misery and violence and abuse in these, in these other beings whose, vet, whose suffering is to them, as significant to them as my suffering is to me, and begin to uh, let them live there, you know, liberate them. And as we liberate them, we will liberate ourselves. But if we don't liberate them, we will never liberate ourselves and we'll continue to be enslaved. And the thing I see really happening, Abby, unfortunately, is that as the uh, social and environmental devastation caused by animal agriculture at the root continues to increase, we're finding now more and more scientists are saying that we may not even have human beings living on this planet in another X number of years, oh, 20 years, yeah. 50 years, 100 years. And, and we won't even know why it happened because we're so asleep. <laughs> so the idea is to... Well, we you know, will. God, we will. God is really real. You know? We'll know why it happened, honey. We'll know. 
<laughs> we'll tell everybody else from the next dimension, like, hey, little angels, remember when we chose to incarnate in human form? Let me tell you what happened and why we're back up here. <laughs> okay? Right. Oh, Lord. It's so crazy. It's just so nuts. I I'm so glad that there's... Yeah, it's like, oh, even, I just, you touch on everything in this book. Everything. Everything. Like, just even overfishing. Fish are, a lot of people don't know this. People talk about sharks. Sharks do eat corpses in, in the waters. They are cleaner uppers of the waters. Guess right, what? Right. I did not know until I read your book that all fish are. All fish. They do eat algae, which I promote a lot in my health coaching for their omegas, right. three, sixes, and nines. You don't need to eat fish oil. Eat what the fish eat to get their shiny scales. Algae. <laughs> so they are right. eating algae to be so shiny, but they're also eating raw sewage that we pour into the oceans from factory farming and our own waste, you know, from the disgusting non-foods that we eat. We are septic and toxic ourselves, and we poop that out down the drain, and the fish eat it. They, when there's untreated sewage that flows into the water from a storm, the fish congregate around the pipe and eat it, and, and they transmute it in their bodies. We need these creatures on our earth for us to survive, you know, but we're overfishing and killing the, the waste disposers of our world. And, and, you know, chickens and birds, they have their place. They're the tillers of our land with their talons. Um, cows, I'm sure, you know, I know have purposes. I mean... They're beautiful, loving animals. They're pets in India. Um, they graze. They keep the grass low. When we overbreed them, they overgraze the grass, which is another entire problem. Oh, I only eat grass-fed murder. Great. So you're just contributing to the overpopulation of cows from being raped. They're not even supposed to populate. They don't get to make love. They don't get to live out a life. Anyway, I'm, I'm di digressing. But Well... Yeah, I think that what you're saying is so important for us to try to understand because we're raised in a society where we're taught that animals are just props in the drama. You know, like we're humans. Everything revolves around us. Animals, what are animals? Well, animals are, yeah, they taste good. You know, maybe, oh, you know, I, I pet my, you know, I, I pat my dog on the head, you know, now and then. But, but basically it's all about us, you know. And so the sense of entitlement that, we, that we're sense in, in really injected with from the time of little kids by eating these meals – is so huge yes. and, and, and covers everything that these animals are reduced to, to just little footnotes in the yeah. great human drama. And we don't realize, and it's so ironic, sometimes I say this, you know, that we look, we look kind of longingly to outer space and we, we think, wow, I wonder if there's any intelligent life other than us human beings in the universe anywhere, <laughs> you know, and all around us. I think there are beings that actually have probably a lot more intelligence than we do. Definitely. They're actually contributing to the world. Because when you think about it, if some of the if really critical species, there's many critical species, I mean, ants and worms and bees and so, so many insects and, and, uh, and prairie dogs. I mean, there's many species that if they go extinct, life on this earth would really be harmed. I mean, things would be you know, just, you know, they're critical. They're so, I mean, but I think yes. everything is, is critical, really. Everything has a place. I think, you know, scientists understand this, I think, somewhat. But, but the basic idea that, that should really make us all, you know, feel what in the heck's going on is the basic truth that we all know, which is that if human beings suddenly disappeared from this planet, it would be the greatest celebration and joy. That's right. The whole, or, you know, Venus and Mars would suddenly hear this, wow, the, the Earth is celebrating, you know. Totally. <laughs> because now totally. the humans are gone, then the, this everything is, it will heal. The, the, the rainforest will heal. The oceans will heal. Yes. The wildlife habitat will come back. Animals will be able to celebrate their lives again here. That's and right. I think that should really make us pause and reflect a little bit. What is our purpose uh, as human beings on this earth? The good news I have to say is that we don't have to, human beings don't have to just leave the planet. We could all go vegan and we'd have the same yes. you know, celebration. That's <laughs> right. We could feed everyone on a fraction of the land. We That's could really feed right. everyone on a fraction of the land and water and uh, and rainforests and everything else that are being destroyed for animal agriculture. We can. There is no lack. I love that you said all that because. Yeah. Um, it's just like our own bodies, our own bodies, the earth as without, so within the earth is always trying to come back into balance, always trying to maintain homeostasis. It's the same thing with our bodies. That's why I say every dis-ease, every disorder is healable. It is, it right. has been proven 
t not by chemo, not by radiation, not by surgery, not by drugs, not by thinking negatively and focusing on the problem, the tumor. That is not healing. But every disease is healable if we get clean, 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 clean. So, you know, other videos, you can watch my other videos for more information about that. But, yeah, the earth, once she spits us out, she can actually clean herself and come back to her radiant, blue-green, gorgeous planet again. Though, I really hope that we get out of this reductionist way of thinking and living like you talk about and get back to realizing that we are whole beings and this is a cooperative ecosystem and we're all one it's interdependent we're all interdependent and you know it's just like modern medicine focusing on the physical the physical let's get the tumor wait let's get the thoughts that created the tumor let's get the, the feelings that created the tumor let's work on the feelings that uh, that allowed us to cut ourselves off from animals as sentient beings and other humans and stick our parents into homes and all these things that we're doing and yeah like Obviously, your whole book is about how our food choices affect our current state of being on the planet. And you mentioned, obviously, reductionist science, which, you know, stripping away our inherent meaning and worth reduces everything to mere physical matter, programming us and numbing us to ignore our feelings and interconnectedness. And it serves what you talked about, which is the crux of the book, too, the hurting mental mentality. And so, okay, here's my question nuclear armament, foul temperaments. I, I work with a lot of kids with ADHD, autism, anger issues. Um, you know, obviously the big kids that grow up are the ones running all the countries in the world that are bombing each other. Not the vegan countries, not the peace loving nations, right? Uh, you know, unforgiving grudge holding. Uh, how is all of this a physical manifestation of our food choices? And what yeah, else a, is going on? Um... That's it. You've, you've done a great job. Well, I, and, I said you know, it. I said it all. Yeah, the key, you know, the key is uh, to understand the power of animal agriculture and our food choices and reducing beings to, to matter to things. And so, and, and how that has infiltrated into our society. For example, when any uh, animal gives birth to a baby, uh, in any kind of animal agriculture situation, that's never her baby. That's my baby. I own you. I own your mother. That's my baby. That's not your baby. So I steal the baby. I'm pregnant you again. And so in many ways, unfortunately, we do birth in our society the same way to, hum to human mothers as we do to cow mothers. I mean, there, there's this, um, yes. real, there's a lot of harshness in the birth process. There's a lot of violence in the birth process. So very, very early on, little babies are separated from their mothers. They don't get to bond that deeply. Uh, like they really should. The, the uh, medical establishment has inserted itself uh, in a way that uh, is very harmful with, with, uh, with drugs and all kinds. And then, don't get me started with all the, the vaccinations and all this other stuff. So there's a terrible abuse of, of little creatures that shuts down their natural uh, powers, the natural connection with the universal cosmic intelligence of their own beings. And, uh, and there's an onslaught really against them. They're, they're slapped, they're hit, they're, they're isolated. They're in, they're, uh, their body integrity is just horribly invaded Starting by toxic substances foreskin. and by violence. The same thing that is done to little pigs and little calves and little chickens. The same thing is done to them. You know, there's, there's over 10,000 drugs and vaccinations and hormones. Just, they don't get a choice. It's just done to them because they're being exploited. It's being done to us because we're being exploited. We, don't, we give a lot of money to the military-industrial uh, complex, and especially the pharmaceutical medical complex, if we're sick and if we're asleep, we'll support those things. That's right. You know, so they do not want people who are awake, who are connected, and who are confident, and who have capacities, um, and who do not need to buy something to be happy. <laughs> we're just happy because they're alive, and they're grateful because they're alive, and they realize that what they are is not just their physical body. See, what we've been taught is that we're just our physical body because cows and pigs and chickens are just their physical body. They're just matter. And so pretty soon, we're just a physical body. We're just a, a piece of meat. And we tell little boys that those girls are little pieces of meat you should use, you know, for yourself. And girls are taught, oh, I'm a piece of meat. i got to make myself look good, you know, like this. And in this whole, this, this terrible suffering that we create 
um, by reducing not only animals but each other to objects, and instruments to be used in all kinds of ways for our, you know, and, and a whole economic system that's based on that and whoever can use the most gets the most, you know, and we have this predatory economic system that comes out of animal agriculture. And so it all creates a lot of suffering and, and, and not only for the animals but really for us. It all works very well to concentrate most of the wealth in the hands of like a tiny elite and it's all completely unsustainable and it's based on this illusion that is keeps getting injected into us through our educational system uh, that science has the answers, that technology has the answers, that medicine has the answers. We have these medical miracles. You can eat whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. And science will, medicine will fix your body. They'll fix your mind. They'll give you the drug to make you happy. They'll give you the drug to make you healthy. And we don't realize that they can never do it. The technocracy can never solve anything. It makes everything worse. Yeah. It, it just covers over the sim symptoms. The problems don't go away. They come back even more forcefully because deep down our natural wisdom does want to shine and radiate and love and grow and awaken. And if we keep putting ourselves in these situations and keep shutting down the, the natural feedback loops, yep. we, and, you know, we're taught not to be aware of all this. So yep. going vegan is much more than just giving up animal foods and, and so forth. It really means a deep internal questioning of the roots of everything. And that's why I love what you're, what you're doing and how you're talking because I can see that you're, <laughs> you're on that path of questioning <laughs> Yeah, oh everything. man, but drove my parents crazy, but hopefully it's doing something to shine light in this world. <laughs> Thanks mom and dad for dealing with my inquisitive self. Well, hey, I've come a long way, baby, because you put a human baby in a crib with a rabbit and an apple and that human baby's going to go for the apple, eat the apple, lick the apple, play with the apple, not and pet the bunny. Okay. <laughs> we are herbivores. All right. If we were meant to eat that bunny, we would eat it. So but no, my, my first phrase growing up as a child, my first words were Abby want mo hot dog. So Abby want more hot dog. <laughs> that was how I said it. But yeah, so I, I've come a long way from my own indoctrination and <laughs> my own crib ig ignorance. You know, I, I have, we, we all need to come a long way for God's sakes to save ourselves. It's not about saving the planet, honey. She's going to spit us out. <laughs> She's going to erupt into a volcano that covers the earth just like Italy. What was that town in Italy? My gosh, it's, I'm blanking. Anyway. Oh, uh, Vesuvius? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wait, trust me. She'll, well, anyway, no, something with a P. Huh, huh. Anyway, um, so I'm, I'm thinking too much about, about Tolstoy. And uh, as long as we have slaughterhouses, we'll have battlefields. And just, it's, it's too much. It's too much. If slaughterhouses had glass walls, there'd be no eating of meat and there'd be no war. Just all of it. It's... It's totally interconnected, right. and you're the torchbearer for all of it. Could you talk a little bit about um, the Sophia, Sophia, the essence of Sophia, and how she's been suppressed in our patriarchal, modern day society of worshiping male energy? Yeah, the, Sophia is the word that I've chosen. I love it. She was the. Uh, I love it. The word Sophia means wisdom in Great. Greek, and and I think Sophia was this uh, this sort of uh, goddess of wisdom in a sense, this uh, outer aspect of wisdom. But I think goddesses and typically in gods as well, they re represent aspect of ourselves, our own in inner wisdom, and so Sophia. I think represents the wisdom within everyone, both men and women. We have this inner wisdom that naturally yearns to love and protect life. Women, I think, have this especially strongly because as a woman gives birth to a little baby, she's got this little being who actually turns out to be nothing but trouble and problems. <laughs> but, but, you know, she just nevertheless just gets up in the middle of the night and is loving and kind and caring. You know, this this wisdom that just yearns to love and give and protect, we, we all depend on that, right? As yeah. little kids, we depend on it. As a society, we depend on it. If we don't have that kind of Sophia love coming through women and through men to love and protect and nurture the family, the neighborhood, the community, the shared commons, you know, the, the, the life that we have, that, that basic sense that life is precious and, and to be protected, that wisdom, but the thing is, that Sophia wisdom is that, you know, animal agriculture is the antithesis of that. It's basically, you know, animal agriculture is not just human beings dominating animals. Really, more accurately, it's men, male human beings dominating and exploiting female animals, especially their reproductive organs and reproductive cycles. 
And so this has been the foundation of our society, and it's led to a society today uh, where the role model for little boys to emulate is a hard, tough, disconnected male, and where we're forced as little kids, both men, little girls and little boys, to eat the flesh and secretions of horribly abused animals, to just basically shut down our hearts, don't think about it. Once we find out what it is, it's like too late. And so we become, we're taught in a way, we're forced and we're indoctrinated to become hard and tough and just go forward and live our lives and compete, get what we want. And that whole way of living uh, is bereft of Sophia. And so, but I think what we're talking about and what the vegan movement is essentially is the resurrection of Sophia in our society, within us, you know, as, as human beings, it's, she's rising up and it's this wisdom of interconnectedness, of, of celebration, of dance and music and art and joy and freedom and creativity and humor, really, and, and being able to, to, to see that this life we have is, is uh, sacred and it's Definitely. to be celebrated. And it's, and it's temporary, right? right it's temporary. Up. It's here for a little while. So why are we wasting our time with these, uh, you, you know, fighting with each other and dominating and exploiting? We could be, we could, this earth is so abundant, it could easily support all of us. Yeah, uh, living a life. You it really could. It. It, of yeah. course it could. If we stop feeding all the grains and water and, right. and everything to the animals. Can you... We're feeding it. Yeah, we're growing enough food to feed everyone. That's right. So, more, than, more than that. Eat your sprouts. Most abundant food on the earth, most healthy food on the earth, sprouts, sprouts, sprouts. Um, another video. Exactly. <laughs> but could you just get a little bit more detailed about exactly what these males do to female hens? Because I think, I think just what I've learned in this journey over 20 years of health and wisdom and is that unless people know exactly what's going on and can relate it to themselves... That's why I like to relate it to what's happening to children of these species and mothers of these species and the fathers. I mean, they're ripping out their horns while they're still alive. They're cutting off their testes while they're with no anesthesia, no anesthesia. I mean, it's happening to the males right. too. Well, if you want to know, I mean, I can, I can talk about that I'd, a little I'd bit. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about it because people need to know what they're eating, I believe, to make really informed choices. And I mean, yeah. it's really profound. We, we talked about the cows and what's being done to them, you know, skinned alive, raped, tortured, murdered, taking children away from them. What about the hens? I mean, that is insanity. What's going on with well, their reproductive systems? I think, you know, in general, animal agriculture, whether it's industrialized, commercialized, large-scale animal agriculture, or small backyard operations, there's always violence and abuse more than anyone ever realizes and uh, it's it's hard to, to, to hear it but I'll just say a few things for example uh, with egg production um, we've we've been actually been to the post office I you know and seen uh, these uh, boxes of, of little chicks that you know that are sent you know they send chick they send chicks through the mail now uh, these chick where do these chicks come from the chicks and, and so so backyard operators or large scale operators they get their chicks through the mail and uh, they come from hatcheries and so at, at hatcheries uh, there's basically uh, workers who do nothing but impregnate female hens against their will on rape racks with these you know syringes of sperm that they get from roosters by masturbating the roosters and it's the same thing with turkeys basically all these animals they have to do sexual abuse to males to get the sperm to put into syringes. Then they stick it in the, you know, it's a, it's impregnating against their will. Then they, then they have these. In the case of chickens, they have they get, they have eggs that are fertilized by this. Uh, half of them will be males, half will be females. The males are useless essentially, so they're uh, killed immediately, basically, usually by being thrown into a wood chipping machines, grinders, or just being suffocated. Both ways are horrible ways to die. And then the females are very typically have their beaks seared off with a hot knife, which is causes not only acute pain and trauma, but also chronic pain and trauma because that's their main way of relating to the world is their is their beak. It's filled with nerves, and so and that's what is cut it like so for humans? Is it like getting a root canal with no anesthesia? Can't even imagine. I mean, it's like cutting your half your face off with no anesthesia. I mean, it's it's just ridiculous. But it's it's um, you know that's their that the beak is everything to a chicken. So anyway, they cut that off, and then and then basically they're typically ninety eight percent of all or probably ninety nine percent of all eggs come from 
uh, some kind of hyper confinement, either battery cages where they can't even move or spread their wings, where their feathers are, you know, you know, just torn off, um, or from so-called free range operations where they're stuck in these stinking sheds where they never see the light of day. Uh, which are marginally, perhaps a little less, but uh, they live a very, very painful, um, we can't even imagine. I mean, they've tried to have putting human beings in a similar situation, college students, and, and, and told them that they would give them $1,000 if they would stay, and no one could make it more than a few hours. Wow, <laughs> you know, they, wow. And, they, and they have to do it for, you know, for a few years oh. these poor, before, they're, before they're killed. So if we're eating eggs... We're eating horrible misery. You know, there's no way around it. I mean, the, the males are, are ground up uh, and killed. The, the females are forced to, to produce many more. I mean, these these are, hens are birds. They they don't know. They usually only have one or two clutches of, of uh, eggs per year. You know, and yet they're they're being forced and pushed uh, to to have hundreds. You know, two or three, two hundred fifty eggs a year. So uh, so that's horrifically. Um, uh, abusive to these animals, and the same kind of things apply also to pigs, to cows. The females in all of these are much more, in, in a way, much more um, seriously abused than the males. The males are abused also. And I've talked to people. For example, I knew a woman. We met a woman actually who who lived next to a, uh, one of these operations where they collect the semen from bulls and she said it was terrible she lived she heard the the cries of the bulls and you know it's, it's just a brutal thing but we now and i have heard also the cries um of the dairy cow mothers uh, all night when we've been in our say parked in an rv near a you know within earshot of a of a dairy and just heard these these moans and wails and it's almost like screams from these mother cows and i think it's important to remember that dairy products always have, you know, the, the mother pays the ultimate price. Those babies are always stolen. The milk is stolen. And basically, on any dairy, organic or not, there's four births typically are, are given. And the fifth one, uh, usually what they do nowadays, because it's very profitable, is they'll impregnate the mother a fifth time after they've stolen four uh, maybe allowed one, and so the fifth one, they st- they they impregnate her, and then they send her off to slaughter when she's about eight months pregnant, so that when they hang her upside down by by one leg and then um, kill you know kill her, cut her throat, and then open her up, there's a calf there. The calf is still alive, and the calf uh, is uh, very profitable because of three things. One, one, one of the things that's probably the most profitable is that they, they, it's the, it's called the bovine fetal serum, which is this, um, the liquid in her heart. So they have this long needle they just put into the, through the body, into the heart of the, and they pull, they suck out the serum. That's just, it's so, so horrible. But anyway, and they use that for vaccinations for humans and for other pharmaceutical things. And then also, the lining of the stomach is is for renin because to coagulate cheese, you need renin. Uh, that's what they always use traditionally. They use renin still today. Yep. So they use that. And then the, the, the skin of these unborn calves um, are, is very uh, good. You know, it fetches a high price for its leather. And so what we have is the uh, this abortion, essentially this violent abortion industry also where these cows are killed, their babies are ripped out of them. And then killed, and dairy products are really, in many ways, in, in many ways, behind the whole abortion problem that's you know, causing so many problems. Because yeah. not only are we aborting, you know, impregnating and aborting millions of these animals, uh, but also um, dairy products unnaturally force uh, women, because of so much estrogen, to have a much earlier menstruation than they normally would. Yeah. You know, we saw that in Japan in just one generation. You know, when the, right after the war, the U.S. dairy industry moved into to Japan, and in one generation, the age of first menstruation went from like 16 and a half to like 12. Yep. <laughs> you yep. know? Now and that it's caused a lot seven. of problems. Yep. Yeah. It's insane. So, and, the, and the other thing, just to say, is that Organic products very often are not are not the answer in terms of sustainability, in terms of anything, uh, because uh, the animals are still suffering. There's all kinds of loopholes in the organic laws, so that these operators, whoever they are, they're trying to make they're trying to produce and make as much money as they can as quickly as possible, 
And so the, there's, the, there's the loopholes allow for tremendous uh, violence. And you can go, to, like, for example, if anyone's interested, just go to the um, Conklin, C-O-N-K-L-A-N, Conklin Dairy video on YouTube. It's, uh, you can find it. It's, it was an undercover investigation of a small dairy uh, right outside uh, Columbus, Ohio. And it just shows the kind of unbelievable, I mean, just terrible violence towards cows and cows by workers because these animals are, you know, they are not cooperating normally. I mean, they're, they're maybe getting in the way and they're, and they're strong and they step on the guy's foot or they, and pretty soon they're just beating them, they're stabbing them, they're just punching them. And nobody's, nobody knows what goes on in these operations, these small operations. Like I, like on, like on that, that little farm in Vermont, you know, how you just turn around one day and say, okay, we're going to kill you. And it takes quite a few shots to kill the animal. You know, it's it, these many botched killings. And in fact, that when we've gone to sanctuaries and talked to people who, um, who run sanctuaries for animals, a few tiny percentage uh, who make it to, to a sanctuary, they, I've heard over and over again that the animals from commercial operations are horribly abused, but the animals from little backyard operations very often are even more abused. Oh, my God. They're gosh. horribly abused. Well, there's no regulation and, in that industry. They self-regulate. Yeah. They're allowed by the government to self-regulate because the government exactly. is that organization. The FDA yeah. and Monsanto and the Western Medical Complex is our government. They self-regulate. Right. They make right. laws to honor and protect themselves, not right. sentient beings, not the health of humans who eat those beings, not the health of factory workers who murder those beings every day. If you don't care about animals because you've never been introduced to them, my nephew is freaked out by animals because he's eating them. He, he, he's never been interacting with a chicken or a pig or a goat or a dog even. Like I know so many kids who are scared yeah. of animals that loving loving beings that boost our immune systems and nurture us they're scared so right you know it's just too crazy but yeah if you don't care about the animals like what about the factory workers what are you a humanitarian anybody out there watching are you a humanitarian because if you don't care about these animals lives what is happening to the factory workers in these farms who are forced to murder thousands of animals every day yeah, we've been to those operations. We've been to slaughterhouses and stockyards, and uh, I have to say, my heart, you know, I'm really went out to the animals, but it went out to the workers because yeah. they have to do work that no one wants to do, and they have the highest rates of injuries and suicide, drug addiction, alcoholism. It's the worst work. Very often, it's undocumented people yeah. who are just desperate to make some money, and um, they, you know, they 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 die. I mean, in dairy operations, quite often they have these huge pits of manure and the, if you get too close to one of those it's happened many times um, the fumes will kill a person and they just fall in and die just from the fumes yeah. the, the, the ma massive amount of nitrous oxide and sulfuric acid and these terrible gases that come out of all this manure and and, and they have to do horrible things to animals they're paid to do that and and uh, and for example also with organic um, Dairy, for example, I've, I've talked to some veterinarians who have told me that organic cows, you know, cows on organic dairy suffer more than on commercial because they're not allowed to use certain things like antibiotics, for example. Like, you know, cows get mastitis on any dairy, organic or not, they get mastitis, which is the inflammation of the udder. And so when their udder you know, gets inflamed, the teats get swollen and, and they get blocked and no, no milk can get through. So on commercial dairies, they give them a lot of antibiotics to try to clear up that infection so the milk will flow again. Um, but then that's standard. So you're getting a lot, a lot of pus in milk. But basically with, um, with organic dairies, they're not allowed really to give them antibiotics and they sometimes test for it. So instead of giving them antibiotics, they use mechanical instruments. You know, they have this like corkscrew-like device that they screw up the teat of the cow and then rip it down to make the milk flow. And you know this is excruciatingly painful for these cows, but the, but living on organic dairies, they have they suffer in, in more actually. So people go to the store and say, "Well, I'm getting organic milk. I'm doing the I'm doing a good thing." Great. And again, they're causing even more suffering. Conscious murder. Oh, conscious so suffering. Yeah, I love that. I mean, that's my last question for us as our hour wraps up. You are yep. so intuitive, Dr. Tuttle. You you led yourself right into it. My last question is, do you think anyone can be truly enlightened eating 
meat and dairy? Can no, you, a no, person no. I mean, reach enlightenment ever it, that way? Basically, spiritual awakening has to do with awakening to the interconnectedness of all expressions of life. That I'm not, you know, I'm no longer under this fundamental delusion of being a separate self whose welfare is dependent on getting what I want, keeping away what I don't want. That's that's the root of ignorance. So if, if I'm paying people to stab and kill animals and I'm eating the flesh and secretions of those animals, no matter how great my mind, I can say, oh, I'm... I'm illumined and I have great compassion for all beings, <laughs> but it really, at a certain fundamental level, there, it, it doesn't add up. There's a disconnect there, and it, so I think really at this point, you know, in many ways, we as human beings, we get the leaders we deserve, and we're getting the spiritual teachers we deserve. <laughs> That's right. You know, we get we we vote for our spiritual teachers, we vote for our our. Um, politicians and we vote by our dollars and you know people you know I, I've seen these spiritual teachers like Eckhart Tolle and all these people and they're still eating animal foods and pe people think they're so great um, but you know that's because we're eating meat and dairy and we like them because they're not questioning that and so any, I think any spiritual teacher that doesn't question uh, the fundamental violence of our meals is not a spiritual teacher they're just basically making money Telling people what they want to hear. That's right. You know, essentially. I couldn't have said it better. And that's why you're my spiritual teacher, Dr. Tuttle. And I go straight to the source, which we all should do. Stop listening right. to God bless religion. I hope it brings people together as a community. Stop listening to your parishion, your, your leaders in the religious movements, in the science movements, in the classrooms. If they're talking nonsense, listen to your creator. Get connected to your creator. I mean, you. thank you, Dr. Tuttle. You are yeah. such an incredible inspiration. I mean, seriously, we've talked about spiritual, physical, emotional, mental, interconnected <laughs> love here. If you want to be balanced, connected, stop eating corpses and carcasses of flesh that are filled with mad cow disease, cancer, tumors, septic hormones, antibiotics, pus, blood, <laughs> pesticides, GMOs from GMO feed. You are eating blocks of this stuff every day and it is affecting your physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, all your chakras. Stop eating that stuff. Open your heart chakra. More importantly, if you need some fire lit under your booty instead of on the barbecue, please, then read Dr. Will Tuttle's book, The World Peace Diet. And start. it starts with us. It starts with you. Get peaceful within yourself. Read his book. And what's your website, Dr. Tuttle? It's just worldpeacediet.com. Yay. Yeah. Worldpeacediet.com. I could not have thought of a better title and a better man and spirit to spread the message. I am so grateful for you. Do you have any last inspiration for us? You know, I, this has been a beautiful uh, time we've had sharing, and I'm, I'm really grateful to you, Abby, for uh, opening up the space for this conversation. I'm grateful to everyone who's listening and watching, and I just, uh, again, it's the spirit not of, of criticism or judgment or blame, just to understand the situation that we've been born into and realize that each one of us has the gift of a human uh, opportunity to be part of a solution rather than being part of the problem to question uh, the exploitation that not only we're causing, but that also we're being exploited if we're eating animal foods, and to take our own spiritual unfoldment seriously enough to look deeply into our lives and to bless others. And as we bless them, we bless ourselves. And all those things you just talked about, uh, the pus and the violence, people say, gosh, you know, but I don't want to give up eating meat like we're giving up something. And what we're giving up, I found, is we're giving up disease and we're giving up pus and misery and violence and stress and despair. And we're really gaining uh, a, a possibility of a new life for ourselves and for others. And it's so liberating. So Hallelujah! It's a, it's really is a Let's reap what we <laughs> sow. Let's reap beauty and sow beauty. And so it is. Amen. So it Please. Is. Thank you for being part of the solution. Dr. Tuttle, I encourage all of us to be part of the solution, and it starts with going vegan and what is on your plate. Thank you. Yeah, Knowledge is power. Thanking for, thank you for giving us back some of our Sophia-oriented power with this conversation. You are a, such a hero and an inspiration, Dr. Tuttle, and I hope you come back soon so we can talk about circumcision. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> You're so Thanks, amazing. Abby. You're Great. so amazing. Thank you so much for everything. I really appreciate you, and I'll, we'll see you soon here on okay. Humanitarian Chronicles. Keep spreading the good word. You're amazing. We will. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Take Bye -bye. care. Bye.